Good morning, friends. We're on chapter 14. After the children have left and only a few teachers caught up in conversation remain, Dita gathers her library together. It might be the last time she does it because she has to tell the truth. She's been marked by Mengala. So before she takes the books back, she removes the roll of tape from her secret pocket and fixes a rip in the Russian grammar book. She takes out the bottle of gum Arabic and glues the edges of the spines of two more books. The book by H.G. Wells has the corner of a page doubled over and she straightens it. And as, she ha as her hand passes over the atlas, she smooths, caresses it, and then all the other books, even the novel with no front cover to which Hirsch objected so forcefully. While she's at it, Dita fixes a torn page using a narrow strip of tape. Then she carefully puts the books inside the cloth bag from Aunt, Aunt Dudine's, settling them in as if she were a nurse putting newborn babies into their cribs. She walks over to the blockle tester's cubicle and knocks at the door. Hirsch is sitting in his chair, writing one of his reports or working out the schedule for some volleyball tournament. She asks for permission to speak, and he turns toward her with his calm face and the smile that no one knows how to interpret. Go ahead, Edita. You ought to know about this. Dr. Mengele suspects me of something, maybe to do with the library. It happened after the inspection. He stopped me in the Lagerstrasse. He'd somehow realized I was hiding something. He threatened that he was going to keep a close eye on me, and I have the feeling he's watching me. Hirsch gets up from his chair and walks around the cubicle for a few seconds with a look of concentration on his face. Finally, he comes to a halt and looks straight into Dita's eyes, says to her, Mengele watches everyone. He told me he'd put me on a dissection table and open me up from top to bottom. He likes dissecting people. He gets pleasure from it. After Freddy has spoken, there's an uncomfortable silence. You're going to remove me from my position as librarian, aren't you? I understand it's for my own good. Do you want to give it up? Freddy's eyes shine. The, light, the little light bulb that he always says glows inside us has just switched on. And Dita's has turned on, too, because Hirsch's electricity is contagious. Absolutely not. Freddy Hirsch nods as if to say, I knew it. Then you'll stay in your position. Of course it's a risk, but we're at war. Although there are people here who sometimes forget that. We're soldiers, Edita. Don't believe those who say we're bringing up the rear and then put down their arms. It's war, and each of us has to fight our own front. And each of us has our own front line. This one is ours, and we must fight to the end. So what about Mengele? A good soldier has to be careful, and we have to be very careful with Mengele. You can never exact tell exactly what he's thinking. Sometimes he smiles at you and it looks as if he really means it, but almost immediately he becomes serious and the look he gives you is so cold that it freezes your insides. If Mengele had any solid evidence against you, you'd already be dead. So it would be best if he didn't see you, hear you, smell you. You have to try to avoid any contact with him. If you see him coming, head in the other direction. If he crosses your path, look away discreetly. The best thing that could happen is that he forgets you even exist. I'll try. Good. Is there anything else? Freddy, thank you. I'm asking you to remain in the front line of fire, risking your life, and you're thanking me? What Dita wants to say is, I'm sorry. I regret that I doubted you. But she doesn't know how. Well, I wanted to thank you for being here. Hirsch smiles. There's no need. I'm where I ought to be. Dita heads outside. The snow has settled over the camp and decorated with it. Birkenau somehow seems less terrible, almost sleepy. The cold is intense, but at times that seems preferable to the feverish conversations inside the huts. She comes across Gabriel, number one recipient of teacher scoldings and punishments. The outrageous ten-year-old redhead is wearing a very wide pants that are way too big for him and held up with string in a grease-spotted shirt that's just as large. He's leading a commando group of half a dozen boys his age. He's up to no good, Dita thinks to herself. There's another group of four or five-year-olds, all holding hands, trailing along a few meters behind the commando group, old clothes, grubby faces, and innocent eyes sparkling like the newly fallen snow. Gabriel is one of the idols of the little children in Block 31, thanks to his ability to dream up all sorts of mischief. Just this morning, he threw a grasshopper at the head of a very pretentious girl called Marta Kovac, and the whole block was brought to a standstill by her hysterical screams. Even Gabriel stopped dead at her over-the-top reaction, which culminated in the girl planting herself in front of him and in a fit of rage slapping him so hard she almost wiped the freckles off his face. 
the teacher in charge, reached the conclusion that Talmudic justice had been served, and classes continued without further punishment for Gabriel beyond the one that had already been delivered by hand. Usually when the little kids follow to watch his pranks, Gabriel tries to shake them off or scare them away. So Dita is surprised that he seems happy to have such a crowd tagging along behind him. She decides to follow them at a distance. She sees them heading towards the camp's exit, at which point she realizes where they're going, the kitchen. Gabriel's friends come to a halt a safe distance from the off-limits kitchen building, but Gabriel continues inside. The others gather around the door. What happens next reminds Dita of a scene from a comedy. Gabriel emerges at a run, followed by a very bad-tempered cook called Bita, who waves her arms like a windmill to scare off the flock of children as if they were birds. Dita realizes they must have come to ask for potato peelings, one of the children's favorite treats. But it seems the cook is fed up with freeloaders, and she decides to send them packing. Gabriel and the older children don't retreat. Rather, the boys split into two groups, leaving a corridor down, down which Gabriel and the angry cook make their way. Gabriel dodges to one side, and the cook almost slips and falls in a patch of ice. When she regains her balance, she finds herself confronted by the group of little children who've just arrived. They're all still holding hands and breathing heavily because of the effort they've made to keep up with the older boys. Bita can't avoid the sight of their permanently hungriest expressions. Caught unawares by a herd of mud and snow-covered cherubs with imploring eyes in front of her, she stops waving her arms and puts her hands on her hips. Dita can't hear her, but she doesn't have to. The cook has a strong personality, rough hands, and a tender heart. Dita smiles when she thinks of Gabriel's cunning. He's led the youngest children to that spot to soften up the cook. Bita is undoubtedly telling him and them in her strictest voice that she's prohibited from handing out any leftovers without authorization, that if the capo catches her or any other kitchen hand doing so, they'll lose their jobs and be severely punished, that this and that and blah blah blah. The children keep looking at her with those doe eyes, so she'll make an exception this time, but they'd better not think of coming back or she'll beat them. Some of the children nod their heads in agreement, fully aware that they have her eating out of their hands. The cook disappears inside the hut and comes back out a few minutes later with a metal bucket full of potato peelings. She puts a halt to the threat of a riot by holding up her large hand, making them come one by one, starting with the youngest and ending with the oldest. Then they return to Block 31, chewing on their potato skins. Dita heads back along the Lagerstrauss in a good mood, but halfway back she bumps into her mother, who is looking unusually disheveled for someone who, even inside Auschwitz, has managed to get a hold of an old bit of comb. Her mother always has her hair carefully arranged. So Dita knows something is wrong. She runs to her mother, who gives her an uncharacteristically strong hug and tells Dita that when she went to meet her husband outside his workshop, he wasn't there. A fellow worker, Mr. Brady, told her that he hadn't come to work in the morning because he couldn't get out of his bunk. Mr. Brady told me that your father has a fever, but the capo said it was better not to take him to the hospital. Her mother is confused and doesn't really know what to do. Maybe I should insist the capo send him to a hospital. To hospital. Papa said that the capo in his hut is a German social democrat, not a Jew. He's aloof, but quite fair. Maybe, maybe the hospital isn't a good idea. The hospital is in, in front of Block 31. Dita stops. She's on the point of saying that the sick people she sees hobbling in usually come out on the corpse cart pushed by Mr. Lada and others, but she mustn't speak of death. Death must be kept far away from her father. We can't even see him, moans Dita, Dita's mother. We can't go into the men's huts. I asked Mr. Brady, who, who's a very kindly gentleman from Br Bratislava, to do me the favor of going inside to see him while I waited at the entrance, and then coming back out to tell me how he was. She has to pause, overcome with emotion. Dita holds her hand. Mr. Brady told me he's no different from how he was this morning, semi-conscious because of the fever, and that he's, he looked bad. Dita, maybe your father should go to the hospital. We'll go and see him. What are you saying? We can't go inside the hut. It's forbidden. It's also forbidden to lock people up and kill them. And I don't see that stopping anyone around here. Wait for me at the entrance to the hut. Dita runs off in search of Milan, one of the assistants in Block 31. Although he's good-looking, Dita doesn't find him very likable. She finds Milan beside Block 31. It's one of those relentlessly cold Polish afternoons, but he and the, a couple of his friends are sitting outside, propped up against the wooden boards. They're killing time, watching the other inmates go, go by and making comments about the girls. She's not thrilled at the prospect of standing in front of these slightly older boys, who have the hint of a mustache under their noses and a host of pimples, but who behave like a bunch of fighting cocks. 
She feels uneasy when she's around them. She thinks they make fun of her skinny legs and her somewhat childish wooden, le woolen leggings. But she parks herself in front of them, knowing that she can't allow herself to be timid. Well, well, screeches Milan, speaking first, so he's clear. it's clear he's the leader. Look who's here. It's the librarian. You're not supposed to talk about that outside block 31, Dita interrupts, and she instantly regrets her gruffness because the boy goes red. He doesn't like being shown up in front of his friends by a younger girl, and Dita has come to ask him a favor. You see, Milan, I want to ask you something. The three friends elbow each other and begin to giggle slyly. Milan, also encouraged, starts to brag. Well, girls usually ask me for a lot of things, he says smugly, glancing out of the corner of his eye at his two friends to see how they're reacting to his words. They laugh, showing their broken teeth. I need you to lend me your big long jacket for a while. Milan's face shows his utter astonishment, and he, his giggles peter out. His jacket? She's asking him for his jacket? He was incredibly lucky to score the jacket when they were handing out the clothing. It's one of the best jackets in B2B. He's been offered bread rations, even potatoes for it, but he's not prepared to get rid of it at any price. How would he put up with those afternoons when the temperature dips below freezing without his jacket? And anyway, he looks good in it. The girls like him more when he's wearing it. Are you nuts? Nobody touches my jacket, and nobody means nobody. Do you hear? It won't be for long. Don't be stupid. Not for a minute. Not at all. Do you think I'm an idiot? I give you the jacket, you sell it, and I never see it again. You'd better leave before I get really mad. And as he's saying this, he stands up with a sour expression on his face. And it's obvious that he's at least twenty centimeters taller than Dita. I only want it for a short while. You can stay with me the whole time to make sure the jacket doesn't disappear. I'll give you my evening ration of bread. Dita has mentioned a magic word. Food. An extra ration for a growing boy who can't remember the last time he was able to satisfy his hunger is a big promise. His stomach growls all the time. The anxiety over food has become an obsession, and the only thing that excites him more than dreaming about a girl's thigh is dreaming about a chicken thigh. A whole ration, he, re a whole ration, he repeats as he weighs up the proposal, already imagining the feast. He would even be able to save part of it to accompany his morning slop and have a real breakfast. You're saying that you'll wear the jacket for a short while, I'll accompany you, and then you'll return it. Right, but I'm, I'm not going to trick you. We work in the same hut, so if I tricked you you'd re and you reported me, they'd fire me from my position in Block 31, and none of us wants to leave that hut. Okay, let me think about it. The three boys put their heads together, and there's a mix of whispers and the odd laugh. Finally, a smiling Milan lifts his head triumphantly. Fine. I give you the jacket for a while in exchange for a ration of bread, and we all get to touch your tits. He glances at his companions, and they nod so enthusiastically, their heads look as if they're mounted on springs. Don't be an idiot. I hardly have any. She notices that the three of them are laughing as if they were having a great time, or as if they needed the sound of their laughter to hide their nervousness and awkwardness when dealing with such matters. Dita snorts. If they weren't so much taller than her, she'd give them each a slap. For being so brazen, or so stupid. But she has no choice. And after all, what does it matter? Fine, okay. Now let me try on the damn jacket. Milan shivers when he finds himself out in the open with only the three-button shirt he's wearing underneath the jacket. Dita puts on the long jacket, which is enormous on her, exactly as she'd hoped. This article of clothing features an item which makes it very valuable to her right now, and which few other such garments in the camp possess. A hood. She marches off with Milan close behind. Where are we going? To Barrack 15. And your tits? Later. Did you say Barrack 15? But that's a men's hut. Right. And Dita puts the, head over her, the hood over her head, leaving it almost completely hidden. Milan stops. Wait, you're not seriously thinking of going in there? Women are forbidden? And I have no intention of going in there with you. If they catch you, they'll punish me too. And I think you're a bit mad. I'm going inside with or without you. The boy's eyes widen, and he shivers even more with cold. If you want, you can wait for me at the door. Milan has to walk faster because Dita is striving quickly, is striding quickly. She sees her mother a few meters away, lurking near the entrance to her father's hut, and she doesn't stop to greet her. Liesel Adler is too upset, is so upset that she hasn't even recognized her daughter inside the male garment. Dita walks into the hut without hesitating, and nobody takes any notice of her. Milan has stopped by the door, cursing, unsure whether the girl has tricked him and he'll never see his jacket again. Dita makes her way through the, the rows of bunks. Some men are lying on top of the horizontal stove, which isn't operating, while others are sitting on their bunks and chatting. 
Some are lying down on their bunks, even though doing so before lights out is prohibited, all of which, all of which suggests that they have a benevolent capo. The smell is really strong, worse than in her woman's hut, a nauseating smell of acrid sweat. Dita hasn't removed her hood, and nobody pays any attention to her. She finds her father at the back of the hut, stretched out on a straw mattress from his bottom bunk. Stretched out on the straw mattress of his bottom bunk. She pulls back her hood and brings her face close to his. It's me, she whispers. His eyes are half closed, but when he hears his daughter, he opens them slightly. Dita puts her hand on his forehead. It's burning. She's not sure if he's recognized her. But she takes one of his hands and continues to talk to him in a whisper. It's usually difficult to talk to someone when you don't know if he's hearing you, but her words flow with surprising ease, and she tells him the things you never stop to say because you think there'll always be time in the future to say them. Do you remember when you used to teach me geography at home? I remember it really well. You know so many things. I've always been very proud of you, Papa. Always. She talks to him about the good times during her childhood in Prague, and the good moments in the Terezin ghetto, and how much she and her mother love him. She tells him over and over again so the words will filter through his fever, and she thinks he moves slightly. Maybe somewhere deep inside he's listening to her. Hans Adler is fighting against pneumonia with very few weapons. A lone, malnourished man, broken by all the elements of war against a microbial army bursting with energy. Dita recalls Paul de Kroof's book about the microbe hunters she had just read before they left Prague. If you look at germs under a microscope, they look like a miniaturized pack of predators, too many to take on. She releases his hand, tucks it under the dirty sheet, and kisses him on the forehead. She pulls up her hood again and turns to leave, and in that moment she catches sight of Milan, a few steps away. She thinks he must be furious, but the boy is looking at her with unexpected tenderness. Your father? he asks. Dita nods. She hunts for something under her clothing and pulls out her evening ration of bread. She holds it out to him. But the boy keeps his hands in his pockets and refuses it with a shake of his head. She reaches the door of the hut and removes his jacket. When her mother recognizes her, she looks puzzled. Will you lend it to my mother for a moment? And without waiting for his answer, she says, put it on and go inside. But Hidita, you'll be disguised. Come on. It's at the back. He, it's at the back on the right. He's not conscious, but I think he can hear us. The woman adjusts the hood and, covered up, goes inside stealthily. Milan stands silently beside Dita, unsure what to do or say. Thanks, Milan. The boy nods and hesitates for a moment as if he's searching for the right words. As far as you know what, Dita says, Dita says to him as she looks down at her almost flat chest. Forget it, please, Milan replies, blushing and waves his hand dramatically. I've got to go now. Return the jacket tomorrow. He turns on his heel and rushes off. He wonders how he's going to explain to his friends why he's returning with no jacket and no girl. They'll think he's an idiot. He could tell them that he ate the bread on his way back to them, and that he touched her tits on behalf of all of them, since the jacket is his after all. But he dismisses that with a shake of his head. He knows they'll spot the lie right away. He'll tell them the truth. They'll laugh at him for sure, tell him he's gullible, but he knows how to fix things like that. He'll hit, he'll hit the first one who says anything so hard, he'll have to search for his teeth with a magnifying glass. And then everyone will be friends again. And that's where we'll stop for now. Uh, join me for the second half of this chapter in just a minute.